if we have any problem with the delay with the minister, which would be entirely understandable in all the circumstances, uh, I might come to, to Derville, first of all, to, uh, to, to, to speak to us. Derville, are you, are you ready to do that? You're muted at the moment. Happy to do so. If you yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine. I, I think in the event that the minister does come on board, uh, I, I might, if you'll forgive me, interrupt because I, I know that he's under severe pressure at the present moment, as I think we all know. I might just interrupt you and, and ask you to let the minister speak and then come back to you. Would that be OK? Sure. So what do we want to do? Would we like to give the minister a little more time or um, do you want I, me to... What would you prefer? I think I'd prefer if you'd start off. Please, start off. OK. So, um, in the way of having to be able to adapt, uh, I'm very happy to start. And if you would let me know if the Minister is able to join us, if you want me to uh, cease transmission and I can resume uh, at a later juncture, that's going to be just fine. OK, I'm in your hands. I agree. Uh, so, I recollect um, Napoleon's dictum that no battle plan survives the outbreak of hostility. So flexibility is the order of the day. And that's OK. And in that same vein, I'm not going to say my introduction, which is thank you, Minister. I'll wait for uh, him to speak first. And I just want to say to everybody, Mr. Justice Hedigan and the organisers of today, uh, I'm delighted to be here. And I want to congratulate uh, Kiron and Joe on uh, their timely and welcome contribution to this important topic. Um, it's said that everyone has a book in them. I'm glad that this one is yours because uh, it's on a subject that is actually quite close to my heart. Uh, regulation is continually evolving and success in a changing and competitive world will require us to evolve in a steady and uh, well-defined way to successfully navigate a changing environment with a focus on delivering positive outcomes for consumers, for businesses, and for the economy uh, that we all serve. So I first want to say that I absolutely recognize most firms aspire to high standards, um, but those who don't cause reputational issues for the sector as a whole, and they can pose a risk to consumers, investors, and wider society. Now, issues such as poor governance, lack of consumer-focused culture, and weak structures of accountability within firms were among some of the issues outlined in our report on the behaviour and culture of the Irish banking retail system. And flowing from that, we proposed um, an enhanced individual accountability regime to address those issues. And I want to explain this a little bit, but first I want to say that um, financial regulation is about being focused on supporting positive outcomes. It's there, of course, to seek to prevent abusive behaviour by financial firms, to avoid crises and instability. But the purpose of financial regulation is really about ensuring that the financial system operates well in a manner that supports effective and sustainable functioning of the economy, the households, firms and individuals, so that they can avail of the services that they need and require in good times and bad, and to the benefit of all in the long term. So we very much understand and see that well-run firms with sustainable business models and effective cultures who do the right thing by their customers and who do well in return are what we are aiming for. And we see the IAF in that context, a tool that will deliver better outcomes, not solely for customers and investors, but also for the businesses themselves. This tool should help firms strengthen their own internal process, foster much better decision making, and ensure that all the firms and their staff know what is expected of them. So we see this as helping senior leaders be crystal clear about their responsibilities, and therefore in a position to better manage their business, which to our mind will straight away deliver better outcomes for customers, investors, and the economy as a whole. And if we look at some empirical evidence or studies from other jurisdictions that already have uh, this regime in force, we can see that that is uh, supported. So the Prudential Regulatory Authority in 2022 conducted an evaluation of the UK senior executive manager regime, and most senior managers 
more than 90% who participated in the survey agreed that this regime supported better behaviours. And most of the firms, again, more than 80%, said that it changed their work practices for the better. So we think that this regime will not just assist the central bank in our mission as a regulator, but it will assist the firms themselves to, to achieve long-term outcomes, to be a more trusted financial services sector, which is in all of our interests. So in line with our own strategy um, about being an open, engaged, future-focused regulator, seeking to anticipate and support innovation, we anticipate that this will place industry in a far better place in the long term to serve our economy. Now, the governor, as was of the Bank of England, Mark Corney noted that markets are not an end in themselves. They serve the interests of the end users. So we need a license of consent to operate from the societies that we serve. And misconduct can cause consumer detriment, a break in that social license, and threaten financial institutions and stability itself. So it's very important that we have effective cultures and governance driving the behaviours, the standards and the outcomes of the firms that serve the economy in financial services. So I see the minister has joined us now, um, Justice Hennigan. Would you like me to stop? And uh, I can take over later. I'm very happy to do that. Durable, and I'm sorry to interrupt your extremely interesting uh, talk, but, but I think we all appreciate that uh, the Minister must be under a very severe time and schedule difficulties with all the hassle that's going on internationally at the present moment, and we're very grateful to him for making time here. So I'll hand over to you now, uh, Minister, if, if I may, and then we'll come back to you, Durable. Thank you for flexibility. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Justice, for that. And I uh, do appreciate Derval uh, 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 taking up the slack on my behalf. I'm afraid I'm having a busy morning uh, due to uh, uh, the tragedy uh, that is uh, taking place elsewhere in Europe and the need for me just to respond back to some of the impacts that it's having on our economy. Uh, so apologies to all of you for being a few moments late. And thank you to Derval uh, for facilitating my absence. So maybe just to say a few words uh, about uh, the book uh, and about the broader topics uh, that your discussion here is focused upon. And uh, before I move on to the book and the themes that we are addressing here today, I do want to uh, acknowledge and thank the authors, uh, Joe McGrath and Kieran Walker, uh, for the work that they have done and also to thank Justice Hedigan uh, for the work that both he and the Irish Banking Culture Board continue to make to the really important journey that we are all on. Um, I'm a, a big reader of books, uh, uh, and uh, I think that um, uh, reading and uh, learning is uh, particularly important in the world that we're in at the moment with the kind of change that is underway. Uh, and the book that we are discussing here today, I think, is particularly timely as we reflect on the contribution that the financial services and banking sector has made over the last uh, number of years as we confronted the consequences of COVID um, in, in helping us recover, in not adding to the level of risk that we faced and to dealing with many, many of their customers and our citizens who faced unprecedented challenges in what were then unique times. But what we are doing is looking ahead. We're looking ahead to the future of accountability, uh, the need for which I do believe is well understood within our banking sector at the moment, and the consequences of the legislation that I'm bringing forward with regard to the individual accountability framework. The legislation that I'm bringing forward is in the context of similar legislation having been initiated in other jurisdictions. And while the uh, legislation that is in place in other countries is still relatively new, I think we can already see early signs that it is having a positive effect. 
And as you're aware, the aim of the legislation that we have is about how we can deliver greater levels of accountability and clarity regarding responsibility to lead to better outcomes across the financial sector and to provide financial institutions with the tools to address meaningful change. Now, I want to acknowledge that this is a journey that I believe is already well underway. And the objective of the legislation is to underpin a thorough transformation of culture that I ultimately believe will be beneficial for all. I've spoken in the past about the need for reform, indeed the transformation of culture in the financial sector, and the importance of the cultivation and the embodiment of an ethos within each firm that recognizes the legitimate interests of customers and where we recognize the values of honesty and integrity, values that I know are, are already recognized, that we know are at the heart of any successful company, but because of the vast importance of our banking sector and financial services sector to our economy, it's really important that we look at how we can explicitly recognize that in the framework that we are now developing. So for example, if we were to face again, the consequences of where we were with the tracker mortgage uh, challenge that we all, that uh, many, many customers of banks faced, it would be really important that we're clear about where accountability lies, but obviously where we all want to be, it is in a position that something like that doesn't happen again. So the aim of the regime that has been brought forward is to allocate responsibility to prevent misdemeanor rather than be punitive. I do not envisage the success of this regime as being measured simply by more enforcement. Instead, what this is about is how we improve governance and how we improve the management of risk and outcomes for consumers. And there are many aspects of the findings in this book that support my view that the provisions of the forthcoming legislation should be embraced and embedded within firms to further accelerate cultural change. Inevitably, the responsibility for fostering this culture falls primarily on those who lead and senior executives with the support and encouragement of their boards. And with individual accountability, those working at all levels in the financial sector are more likely to consider the implications of their actions if they in turn are aware of the consequences of their actions for themselves. Although there is often an expectation that this change in behavior and attitudes can be introduced and adopted swiftly, I want to clearly signal that time will be needed for the changes that will be introduced in the bill to bed down and become a core element of the operation of our financial sector. So just a few words on the main areas of the bill. Firstly, with regard to the senior executive accountability regime and conduct standards, what this is focusing on is ensuring that there's absolute clarity as to who is responsible for what, uh, to, as I said, further cultivate a culture of personal accountability, but also to safeguard against scapegoating if something goes wrong. The introduction of common conduct standards for all those working in the financial services sector in both senior and junior roles will require that they act with honesty, with integrity, with due skill, they cooperate with the central bank, and they pay due regard to the interests of customers and treat them fairly. Further, additional conduct standards will impose binding obligations on persons in senior roles, and the standards for businesses will create a single reference point, setting out clear and simple terms for conduct standards that all firms, regardless of the sector, must meet. In short, I don't believe that there's anything that anyone could reasonably object to in our current draft legislation, or nothing that anyone taking up a position of responsibility 
in a financial services provider wouldn't reasonably expect to be part of their normal routine. But the book does point towards the need for continuing with the professionalization of the financial sector in a way to promote ethical norms that should be followed by individuals in the financial sector. With regard to fitness and probity, enhancements in that regime will ensure that the regime has the ability to support the individual accountability framework by improving the processes by which individuals are assessed for their suitability for financial services roles and to investigate where there are reasons to doubt their sustainability. This will serve to strengthen the existing obligations and firms and intensify their focus on the fitness and probity of their key personnel. With regard to breaking the participation link, this is to ensure that an individual can be held accountable for his or her actions without the need first to provide a contravention by a firm in which the individual participates. The introduction of individual accountability does not mean that firms as such will no longer be held accountable for their actions, but rather the responsibility of firms and individuals will operate side by side and complement each other. Finally, of course, in drafting and implementing the new accountability legislation, we must recognise that we have a constitution that provides strong protections for fundamental personal rights. Therefore, a careful balance has been struck between giving the central bank, our regulator, the power it needs to do its job effectively and the protection of individual constitutional rights. Therefore, it has been necessary to consult with the Attorney General's office from an early stage in the process of preparing the legislation. This substantial engagement has been really valuable in achieving the correct balance between effective powers and proper safeguarding of the rights of those that are regulated. And I'm determined that we have legislation that's robust and also recognises the need for this balance. And we'll do all of this in a world that continues to change so quickly. The pandemic accelerated the move to transacting and living in a digital world, and we've all adopted to engaging with financial services online more and more. Now more than ever, as we embrace the digital age, continuing in our journey to restore public trust in the financial sector is essential, not least, of course, for the sector itself. Therefore, this legislation will play a critical role in us. I take the issue of trust in this sector really seriously, and I believe that this bill and the regime it will bring forward will be a key driver in continuing to restore trust and achieve the objective of cultural change across the sector. It will provide an effective framework and will help to reassure the public of meaningful cultural change that's underway that needs to and will continue in the future. And I know that all involved in this sector will make the most of this opportunity. Thank you, Justice. Thank you very much, uh, Minister, for those uh, very thoughtful and uh, very encouraging words as well. Um, uh, I know that you may be under some pressure, so you may not be able to stay on for the meeting, so please feel free to bail out whenever it's convenient for you. Yep. Thank you very much for your attendance here today. It's greatly appreciated. Derva, can I come back to you then for the rest of your very interesting talk? Yes, uh, I'd be delighted to, and I'm uh, very happy to have heard uh, the Minister's remarks uh, and I hope I can um, take up um, from there in a, a way that uh, complements and frames uh, the information for the audience because um, I think that uh, the proposal that is under uh, draft at the moment is in line with best practice and it's going to give us a proportionate and predictable framework to support us to fulfil uh, a beneficial role for firms in supporting our economy, the needs of investors and consumers. And if we just take a moment and recognize that good organizational culture 
is a more than good people avoiding doing bad things. It's actually about equipping good people to do even better things. So the route to better outcomes for business, as well as customers, is a really powerful incentive to get this framework right. And in order to deliver, firms need to be effectively managed. They need to be well organized. People who work in firms need to be really clear about what their role is and their responsibilities. They need to know um, their accountabilities and they do need to be clear the consequences if they fall short of the standards expected. And it's been my personal experience and I'm sure the experience of others that that's especially important in large organizations that are complex, uh, where things can go wrong and accountabilities across systems, across geographies, across business lines, across governance can sometimes be unclear or fragmented. So the bigger you are, the better you had be at being crystal clear about responsibilities and accountabilities. But it also goes without saying in an increasingly technological and rapidly changing world, the need for effective governance underpinned by strong ethical cultures and robust delivery systems, which are all basically running on trust is absolutely essential. So small scale businesses run on digitalized uh, operations now, as well as large scale businesses. So the machines have got to work well, but the people directing them have got to work well too. So the, enha the enhanced accountability framework you've heard is about conduct standards, the senior executive accountability regime, enhancements to the fitness and probity regime, and strengthening the enforcement process. The conduct standards, it's important to recognize, are going to apply to all sectors. The standards comp uh, comprise common conduct standards for individuals carrying out controlled functions and additional conduct standards for senior executives and the most important standards for the businesses themselves. So the conduct standards set out the behavior expected of firms and their staff. And we've already heard, it's about obligations of honesty, integrity, and to act with due skill, care, and diligence in the interests of consumers. And we think these are standards that firms and the people working in them already hold themselves to these standards. And the additional standards will apply to senior executives, requiring them to meet the standard of reasonable care in how they manage their respective areas of business. The initial scope of SEER will include credit institutions, certain insurance undertakings and investment firms, and it's going to amount to about 150 firms. It's going to require in-scope firms to set out clearly and comprehensively where responsibility and decision-making lies in order to ensure coherence and transparency. Firms will be required to provide statements of responsibilities for each senior executive function, which details role and responsibility in addition to complementing the management responsibility map for the firm as a whole. So we will have a clear, integrated, coherent, a picture around the systems of control, responsibilities and governance. And we think that will really support senior management in implementing a really good effective governance framework by identifying any risk or gaps in their controls framework. The fitness and probity regime, we've already heard about some of the enhancements there. And one of the key areas to focus on is a positive duty of firms to certify now that each control function holder um, is um, meeting the requirements. And that I think will have a really good, beneficial, positive uh, impact on culture and standards. And the enforcement process, uh, we have learned through using that it needs to evolve over time. And you heard it from the minister about being able to take uh, cases against firms and individuals uh, in a parallel uh, framework which I just think brings us into a more modern and straightforward way of doing our business. But of course, proportionality will always be a factor. Um, I just want to uh, talk a little bit for a moment about uh, the need for firms to own their own culture. I mean, we've talked about the commonality internationally between the UK, Australian and the Irish frameworks, uh, and that's really important. Um, and we see this as a great opportunity for driving conduct within firms 
and leading to an enhancement in uh, ethical culture across industry. Culture here is really central to all of this. And the moral philosopher, Professor Honora O'Neill, who actually came and spoke at the Central Bank's Culture Conference a number of years ago, uh, was really powerfully persuasive on the need to focus, in fact, on trustworthiness. And she broke it down uh, into something quite simple by saying to firms, be what you want your customers to see. She had three component parts uh, of trustworthiness, competence, honesty, and reliability. Competence being a matter for bringing the relevant skills to each task. And where the tasks are multiple and complex, those skills will be many and very demanding. Honesty is a matter simply of saying only what is intended and doing uh, what is required to undertake what is intended. And reliability is a matter of achieving that competence and honesty, not on special occasions, but with boring regularity. So we understand that culture is for each individual firm in the first instance. Regulators cannot drive culture in firms. We can comment, encourage, nudge, but it is for each firm. And so that is a matter for the leadership, for the boards uh, of those firms. And it's up to them to set the right values, to guide the desired behavior, to lead by example, um, with regular reinforcement of that. And we focus on organizations that can play a role and support that cultural change. And I note the wider landscape the professional services industry, advising lawyers, accountancy firms will play a part, as will the culture board, as will professional bodies who will encourage the firms to adopt those necessary high standards. I too can say, uh, in unison with the authors of the book, that sanctioning is no silver bullet. And um, it resonates with our core view that uh, the law alone cannot compel cultural change. And in that context, enforcement in our mind is never to be viewed in isolation. Sanctions play a role in addressing issues, punishing wrongdoing and deterring further misconduct. Enforcement is absolutely a critical component part of any effective regulatory system. You need a high quality regulatory framework that sets the policy frame within which the rules to operate uh, are set. You need effective risk mitigation and supervision of risks that are crystallizing, and you need targeted enforcement deployed proportionately to support the outcomes we seek to deliver. We have a broad range of powers and we have an escalation pyramid. Enforcement sits at the top where many other powers are used in advance of reaching uh, that very um, expensive and uh, careful uh, tool that is needed, but proportionately uh, deployed. We see the individual accountability regime as primarily a governance tool that should help drive good standards, better outcomes, and not an enforcement-led tool at all. In fact, it's more ex ante, preemptory, and should de-risk the system if adopted and internalized well by the firms. In terms of practical next steps, um, the legislative process is ongoing and we hope that the bill will be enacted into law during the course of the months ahead. The general scheme provides that the central bank uh, will have regulation making power in respect of SEER, the conduct standards and certification. And we will work in parallel to complete the new framework um, and you can expect that we will move quickly once the bill is enacted to consult and engage with key stakeholders on the very many issues that will arise, particularly key issues of operationalization. The consultation that we propose to undertake may include draft regulations with accompanying guidance on those key component parts to ensure that the complementary policy framework and operationalization uh, framework is put in is uh, relevant, uh, effective, and um, has smooth path to uh, implementation. I'd strongly encourage firms now to get ahead of the curve and to internalize what in effect is going to support their own governance, 
by looking to their own responsibilities, their own gaps and their own approach and start the work so that they can be as effective as possible in um, harnessing the benefit of the opportunity we have in an individual accountability regime. Um, for us, the implementation will be an important focus for us and the firms. This is a long-term beneficial uh, support for regulation and for the firms. So it's important that we take the time to get it right. But I am suggesting to firms that you get on with it. It is coming and it is to your advantage to be ahead of the curve. And I think that it says something to the firm's culture itself, where it can move early to adopt uh, rather than being waiting uh, to be made. Uh, and that of itself is a huge cultural indication of um, effectiveness and looking out for good outcomes for the firm and for consumers. So I think that uh, I will close on saying that uh, Professor O'Neill cited Gillian Tett um, in terms of silo effect. And they said shared culture is a powerful engine of coordination and can also be faster, cheaper, and more pleasant to rely on than law, regulation, and accountability. So thank you. Thank you very much, David. Ben. And that nice, pleasant note, yes. And uh, that's a most interesting and thought-provoking view from the central bank as to their attitudes to the upcoming uh, individual accountability framework. Um, I thank you very much for that, Dora. And thank you again for your uh, flexibility in, in dealing with the, the, the minister's scheduling problems. Uh, we're going to move now to the uh, to the panel discussion part of uh, of this uh, this opening this launch today, and I'd like to come first of all to our authors. And could I could I come to you first, Joe, and ask you to could you outline the the main themes or arguments in the book as you see them? Um, sure. Um, first, um, we would like to thank you, Mr. Justice Hedigan, for your kind and thoughtful forward um, to the book. Um, we also want to thank the panellists who are here today giving so generously of your time. And of course, we want to thank the various people who read drafts of sections of the book and who helped us uh, hone our ideas. Um, the book itself is a critical analysis of individual accountability regimes in Australia and the UK and the anticipated uh, regime in Ireland. And our analysis is informed by criminological theory, regulatory theory, and the behavioral sciences. And essentially, we're just trying to figure out what works and what doesn't work when it comes to improving banking culture. Um, we argue that behaviors are a result of a complex interplay of factors at an individual level, an organizational level and at a broader structural level, including industry-wide norms. And we argue that these individual accountability regimes are valuable and important tools in addressing individual behaviors and organizational cultures, but also that they can only be so effective because they're not designed to address structural issues like industry-wide norms. And so we've dedicated the last chapter of the book to addressing this issue. In that chapter, we argue in favor of the professionalization of the banking sector. And that uh, phrase, which we've uh, adopted, which is a trajectory towards professionalization, um, was first used by the um, Parliamentary Committee on Banking Standards back in 2013. Um, which also advocated that path. And the idea is here that bankers will develop an independent professional identity, which is separate and distinct from the hierarchies of their own firms. Now, in making that argument, we're really saying that we see a greater role for industry itself to play a greater role in promoting positive banking cultures that the industry itself could promote higher standards above and beyond those that are already required by the CBI. And that could take a variety of forms as we discuss in this, in this book. It could involve a greater educational emphasis at an early stage on the pro-social role 
uh, that banking plays. It could involve a professional association that internally steers behaviours. Um, and it could involve the industry itself leading the way in creating um, a code of ethics. Now, in making that argument, we are not saying that there is, uh, that there should be a dilution or a diminution in the role of the state or the role of the CBI. We're not saying that at all. In fact, what we're saying is that we see the great benefits in a plurality of regulatory approaches to improving banking culture. And in fact, even as I look around this Zoom call now, this, this, this book launch, we see um, the government, we see the regulator, we see industry, we see practitioners, and we see academics writing from a public interest perspective. So we see that there is already this plurality of interests in promoting a positive banking culture. So I would say that the foundations are already set in place. All that we have to do now is to reignite that interest, that esprit de corps in banking, um, and build on that going forward. Joe, thank you very much. That's a very, uh, very interesting uh, commentary there. Kieran, uh, could I come to you and ask, on the basis of your researches, what is your view on the likelihood of the new individual accountability framework leading to significant improvements in behaviour and culture in financial services? Yes, certainly. Thanks. Um, could I start actually just by reiterating Joe's comments and thank you to um, yourself, Justice Hedigan, for your very kind comments in, in your board of the book um, and also to the other participants, uh, panellists in, in this session. And also, as Joe said, we've been very fortunate to have had the benefit of insights from um, practitioners, um, academics uh, and others in various jurisdictions who've been uh, extremely helpful in their in their comments as, as we've uh, developed the, the text over time. Uh, so to come to your question, um, well, it's, it's certainly too early at this stage to reach any reliable conclusions, um, but I think there are a few um, factors that are worth um, emphasizing at this stage. Um, firstly, um, when we look at other jurisdictions, in particular the SNCR in the UK and uh, the BEAR and, and soon, soon to be the financial accountability regime in Australia, um, we do have some survey evidence that consistently shows that um, these new regimes in these other jurisdictions have actually led to improvements in internal governance and behaviours. Um, and, you know, the, the PRA and um, the FCA in the UK and, and other uh, regulators have carried out various surveys that have indicated that um, the, these new regimes have already uh, had a positive impact on culture and behaviour. Um, and what they tend to show uh, typically is that um, an important aspect of this is achieving clarity with regard to who is responsible for what in organisations for the benefit of both firms and the regulator. Um, it did surprise me a little bit that um, for people in a lot of firms that I spoke with in Australia and in the UK, they were pleasantly surprised that when they were set to the task of identifying who actually is responsible for what within their organisations, or typically in large organisations, um, they actually learned a lot about internal governance uh, and about who was responsible for what in the process. So it brought that clarity um, to that, uh, which is an important aspect, a uh, critical aspect of internal governance. And also, of course, as part of that, um, it has served to concentrate the minds of those who are uh, affected individuals um, who uh, are clearly identified to be individually accountable for areas of the firm's business. Uh, it, it concentrates their minds on their ethical responsibilities and the implications for them are of failing uh, uh, or downplaying their uh, ethical responsibilities as they carry out um, their responsibilities. Interestingly also, uh, I think one of the best surveys um, on this was carried out by uh, the academic um, Elizabeth Sheedy in Australia. Um, her December 2020 survey of the implementation of the Banking Executive Accountability Regime there in Australia um, a very in-depth survey. Uh, she pointed out that um, the, the evidence that she had gathered from surveys and other sources was that the regime also had an empowering effect in terms of getting things done more efficiently and effectively, uh, clarifying decision-making and clarifying oversight, 
Also, of course, increasing uh, the role for um, second and third line functions, in particular at risk and compliance, who became, whose voice within the organization became more important. Um, so it, it, was, it was certainly empowering for them, but also decision makers at the various layer, layers of firms. So that did give rise to a positive shift. Um, a second point I'd make, which has actually already been made, is um, when we're looking to assess, well, how successful um, have these reg regimes been uh, in other jurisdictions and how successful are they likely to be in Ireland? It's important to be clear on what sort of metrics we might use to measure success. Um, and that's not easy, but I, I think um, certainly um, I fully agree and we make this point in, in the book uh, uh, with what Minister uh, Dunham has said and Durham has also said around um, the role of um, enforcement actions uh, I know there have been some criticisms of the SMCR in the UK because uh, there's only been uh, one um, successful sanction against an individual in the six years since the um, SMCR has been running in the UK. But I really don't think that um, a measure of success is the number of um, successful enforcement actions taken against individuals. It's an element of the overall picture, but I don't think it gives an appropriate um, measure of what success looks like. I think it's much more around, um, and these are it's more intangible to 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 measure. Um, it's much more around improvements in internal governance, but also uh, bring me to my third point. I want to emphasise is that for it, for the regime to be successful, I think it's much more around normalising improved standards of behaviour, and to normalise improved standards of behaviour, I think that does uh, really require, as a practical matter, the active engagement of the industry as a whole and other stakeholders. Um, so one example of that, I think, is around when we look at, well, what are the conduct standards uh, and what do we mean by the duty or responsibility to take reasonable steps? What, what, what does reasonable steps actually mean? Um, interestingly, in uh, the 2019 industry survey by Finance Ireland, when they, when they, they were assessing the impact of SMC in the UK, uh, one of the recommendations was that further guidance should be made available on the conduct rules and that, and that such guidance is unlikely to be provided by the regulators and may be an action for industry to pursue itself. Um, I think there what the industry was recognising was that there may be to some extent a reluctance on the part of regulators to um, uh, provide too comprehensive guidance on aspects of this because there's always a risk that uh, elements of the industry will, if you like, game the system. But this is where the industry itself recognises that it has a role um, uh, to, uh, if you like, normalise and clarify areas of, of what we mean by uh, what are reasonable steps. So I do think a process of active engagement by the industry will also actually facilitate an internalisation of the ethical norms. So, so it's not just a, if you like, a vertical um, relationship regulator regulatee. It's also engaging the industry as a whole to uh, engage in the process of internalizing those ethical norms, and I think that will lead to improved uh, chance of success of the regime. Um, and more generally, another aspect, of course, is uh, necessarily is that um, in the implementation of all of this, you know, when it comes to looking at well, uh, what are, what should firms do in terms of the annual, annual certification process? Um, what is the level or nature of investigation that should carry out in relation to um, individuals and assessing the fitness and probity and when issues arise, you know, how all of that should be done. I do think that the industry has an important role around all of that, uh, about normalising improved standards. Um, as, as the Dutch regulator has said, essentially peer pressure regulates behaviours. So uh, it's important, so if, for, for these norms, improved norms to be embedded, I do think there's a hugely important role, as, as Joe mentioned there, for example, around education, the Institute of Banking has a very important role. Uh, of course, the Banking Culture Board has a very significant role uh, in terms of developing standards and engaging with the industry to, um, to improve standards. So in summary, I, I'm really confident that this new framework will lead to improvements in behavior and culture. But it will take some time and to be successful i think it will no doubt benefit for from even more industry-wide engagement and involvement Thank you very much uh, kieran and uh, and joe as well that's a, a very interesting perspective from the from the the two authors uh, now we're we're fortunate to have uh, colin hunt the ceo of aib here with us today on, on, on this panel 
and of course he can give us the perspective from uh, the, the the banking the, the banks end themselves and be very interested to hear that so Colin do you consider that the new regime will bring about positive changes in financial institutions and what do you see as the main challenges of implementing the new regime oh you're you're muted I'm still falling for that. Uh, well, everyone is. And thank you very much indeed for the invite to join you today. Um, I really, really uh, warmly welcome the uh, the opportunity to speak with the, the panel and to speak to the attendees. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate Joe and Kieran on, on, on the book. Um, it is very comprehensive and most importantly from my uh, uh, perspective in terms of a broader resonance, it is very, very accessible to people who are non-expert in banking a non-expert in regulation. So, so well done uh, on that. Uh, I, I have a view, uh, a really, really strong view, that there is a positive symbiotic relationship between um, the banking industry uh, and between the well-being of the economies and the societies that we are here to serve. And I also believe that a strong banking system can be a force for great economic and social good. But what do we mean by a strong banking system? Well, first and foremost, it has to be a banking system that is customer-centered. That also has to be underpinned by strong capital and liquidity, very careful risk management, effective and strong regulatory oversight, and it also needs banks to be staffed uh, by people of competence and people of integrity. But it also must be underpinned by trust, uh, the list isn't exhaustive, uh, but focusing on that trust, uh, the, the crash of 2008, the, the massive recapitalization of the banking system in this country, associated austerity measures, and a number of very, very damaging issues, including tracker mortgages, inflicted a huge blow uh, to trust of the Irish people in the Irish banking system. And we're still grappling with the consequences of that Today, I recognize and I fully accept that a very large part of that shattering of trust was self-inflicted. And as I said already, a trustworthy, efficient and sustainable banking system is vital to the safe and effective functioning of our economy and wider society. Here in AIB, we've been working with our colleagues across the industry and indeed other stakeholders over the last few years to help rebuild trust uh, in the sector, and that is an ongoing task for us all. And I recognize fully that trust is something that has to be earned over multiple years. Uh, and that banking must therefore be, and be seen to be, uh, dependable, honest, responsive, and responsible. Across the, 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 the wider uh, banking sector, you know, we're, we're, we're all working on, on building a, a positive customer-focused culture. We seek to respond to our customers' needs, including during very, very cha challenging times as evidenced by the way the sector uh, moved swiftly to respond uh, to the impact of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, we will get things wrong, but we must ensure that when we get things wrong, we fix it expeditiously, comprehensively and quickly. I very, very strongly support, as does AIB, the establishment of the, the support of the establishment of the Irish Banking and Culture Board under your leadership, uh, Mr. Justice Hedigan. And we have worked very closely with the IBCB, along with the other banks uh, since uh, its inception. And within the bank itself, we have uh, codes of conduct and speak up policies in place to encourage a culture of, of customer centricity, a culture of openness, and to provide channels where employees feel safe in speaking up about issues of concern to them. Um, we have gone through, I would argue, a very substantial transformation in recent years, but we are, we still have loads more to do. There is so much more to be done as we seek on a day in day out basis to rebuild trust in uh, this sector. We welcome the, the, the proposed individual accountability framework. Uh, I regard it as an opportunity for the industry. And I think it will contribute or can contribute and should contribute to building public sec confidence in this sector 
by demonstrating greater accountability on the part uh, of uh, bankers. Uh, we, are, we are taking the necessary steps to prepare for its implementation. That work is already underway. And um, we're very, very supportive of the conduct standards, namely that all our staff should conduct themselves with honesty and integrity, act with, uh, with, with, with due skill, care and diligence and the interests of our customers. These are the standards that any banker should be held, uh, held to. Uh, we're already seek, seeking to hold ourselves to them uh, and the standards that our customers rightly uh, expect of us. I believe that this uh, initiative, that the, the SEER will help us in terms of the safe management of the organization. I think it'll provide further clarity as to exactly where responsibility and accountability lies for different aspects of our business. Uh, and also make it very clear where accountability lies in, in discharging the responsibilities that senior executives within the banking system have. We have some experience from the UK. We have a number of senior executives over there who operate under a, a, a similar regime. And the, uh, the, 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 that has been positive for the safe management of our organization in Britain. Uh, there are obvious learnings from what happened in the UK and, and particularly that we take the, the time necessary to implement uh, and to prepare for the implementation of the new framework in a considered uh, way, but also in an enduring way. And my, my own view for what it's worth is that like, like any initiative with cultural change at its core, uh, fully embedding this is going to be a multi-year uh, endeavor, uh, but the rewards will be worth it if we create a safer, more enduring, more responsive, more stable, and a stronger banking system. Um, but I, I'm, I am really confident uh, that working together, the proposed new regime will significantly build on the work that we're all trying to uh, bring about in order to bring about further, we're all, we're all trying to engage in, in order to bring about further positive change in the banking sector. And that is undoubtedly in the best interests not only of the sector, but of every single stakeholder that we serve. Thank you very much, Rosa. That's a very interesting perspective from the, the, the banks and, and a, a very positive and optimistic one uh, as well. Uh, the SEER regime as, a, as an opportunity, indeed, it, it certainly is. Uh, and thank you for, the, for that contribution. Um, we're also very fortunate to have on our panel today Mary O'D, who's the CEO of the Institute of Banking. And um, Mary, can I come to you and ask you, what do you see as the role of the Institute of Banking in improving behaviours and culture in the industry? Thanks, Justice Hedigan. And like others, uh, I'm delighted to be here uh, as part of this very important discussion today. And uh, I also want to really congratulate uh, Joe and Kieran for the book, as Colin said, it is very accessible. Uh, it's, it's a great read. Uh, and I'm sure the people in the room are indeed people like me with a massive interest in this area. So I, I thoroughly recommend it. Uh, you, can, you can download it indeed, or you can buy it, but it's a fantastic read. And of course, you won't be a, a bit surprised to hear me say um, that I very much agree with uh, the conclusion uh, in the final chapter of the book, uh, the overall conclusion around uh, increasing the professionalization of the industry. And there's some very interesting discussion within the book as to what that means and how that might come, come about. And of course, that leads very much into what we've been talking about today, that intersection of ethics, culture and professionalism within the industry and where education fits into all of that. So for me, the professionalism piece encompasses both competence and skill, as well as the ethical standards we've been talking about. And where an industry uh, really values these attributes, we see that in the culture of the industry. And that's, I think, the part where we're very much working towards. As regards IOB's own role, as you asked me, Justice Hedigan, let me just take it from three different uh, angles, if I may. So ILB, first of all, uh, is a not-for-profit professional membership body. That's what we are. So our very mission, we are very, very mission focused. And our mission includes educating, enabling and empowering a community of professionals. So we have about 34,000 
um, professionals within our community to deliver financial services to the highest standards. And of course, that's in the interests of raising standards, not just in the sector, but in the best interests of customers and getting better outcomes for society. So that mission informs our decision making. The second thing I would say is that we're very strongly focused on the competence piece. Derville quoted uh, Nora O'Neill there earlier on as dividing uh, culture down into different areas, uh, one of which was very much around the competence and skill area. So that's where our particular focus is around the competence and skill area of four professional members. As a recognised College of UCD, this professional development is very much at the heart of what we do for our members. And we want to sustain those appropriate and relevant qualifications that are essential to meet both customers' needs, but also regulatory expectations. The courses that we offer range from master's level, such as financial advice, financial planning, etc., digital uh, culture, which I'll talk a little bit about in a moment, um, compliance and international financial services. So they go from uh, the level nine masters to level seven uh, certificates right across the range. But of course, professional, it, professionalism isn't only about getting the knowledge in the first instance, it's also about maintaining that on an ongoing basis. And I think this is the, the real crucial aspect here. So the third element that I would say is very much around that professional development. The vast majority of our members hold a professional designation and in order to continue to hold that designation, they must undertake a suite of continuous professional development throughout the year. And all of those suites of professional development include ethics within that. So there'll be mandatory requirements uh, around ethics for that. And this then commits them to career long, uh, lifelong learning. And that's very much our um, unique part, I believe, is that, that there's that lifelong element to it. So this really distinguishes to me what is a professional. So if you're really holding yourself out as a professional, it's that dedication to lifelong learning. Now, it's important to say within financial services that there are many people who are committed to that course of learning because that is regulatory mandated. So the regulator has mandated some of that learning within the QFA qualification, for example, and people therefore sign up to that because of regulatory mandate. But that's again, no different to other professionals um, such as the legal profession or the medical professional referred to in the book, where again, there's a, a, an element of mandate about that. Within our own uh, professional organization, of course, there are also others uh, who voluntarily sign up to designations and have a suite of learning behind that. So in terms of our role uh, in IOB in implementing the regime and improving culture, I think that's the sort of critical role that we would play. A well-educated workforce supports a quality service and promotes a much more effective uh, culture in an organization. Maintaining your knowledge on an ongoing basis then helps you to embrace the many changes we see in financial services. And if we know anything, we know that the education that we learn today is something that's continuously moving on. Um, so for example, um, digital programs wouldn't have been something we would have seen, seen maybe even five years ago, 10 years ago. Now that's a crucial aspect of most people's jobs within financial services. So really embracing that, those ongoing needs and indeed regulatory change that comes with us as well. Now, I think one thing I do want to be very clear about, and I think the authors are very clear about this in the book too, is that this is one element of supporting an effective culture. And I think we, we all sort of said that view at different times uh, in the room here today, that really the other key part is leaders in organizations. And I think Colin also referred to this, um, using appropriate values and promoting an effective culture in an organization to have really good decision making and working to create that more effective culture. Indeed, the work of the culture board uh, moves into that kind of territory. In order to support our stakeholders in those particular areas, I do just want to highlight um, two programs that we run in that area. So we have two programs around culture. One is at level nine, and that's very much around the decision-making uh, leadership areas and the decisions that come around culture there. 
It's also important to say we're very focused today um, on the banking side, but of course that program uh, is taken by people right across the financial services area at leadership level. So that's very much focused as a leadership program. And then there's the level seven program, uh, which is focused at anybody from senior man manager and beyond within the organization. And that really focuses on conduct standards. So what are the conduct standards that are expected? But it also supports the piece around individual integrity and people making individual decisions about uh, integrity all the time. And I think the pieces within the um, culture program, particularly at the level nine area, around things like cognitive bias, decision making, what happens when you know, your values collide on a decision, for example, and then how do you relate that and communicate that within your teams? Um, have got some, some fantastic engagement in the classroom as people talk these through. And uh, one of the things that I think happens a lot in IOB, people also learn from others within the classroom, within case studies, et cetera, that we work through. And then the other thing we like to do within all of our programs is we set out about two years ago to define our specific graduate attributes. So we said for everybody that comes through an IOB program, are there particular attributes that are really important to our sector that we want to make sure cuts right across all of our programs? And one of those attributes that we have is around culturally and ethically aware. And that's really about developing a personal integrity. And we do that as we go through our program uh, reviews and look at all our various programs. Uh, we want to see where on the program we can build that into whether it's case studies or decision making, et cetera, and pull it through all of the various um, programs, even those that are very technical. And then finally, I'd say that as a membership body, and we see ourselves very much as that community of professionals, a membership body, we aim to adhere, uh, to have adherence to very, very high standards. So whenever anybody joins up uh, with IOB, um, they do sign up to our full bylaws, which include uh, upholding the best standards of integrity, professionalism, propriety, objectivity, and fairness. So people automatically stand up for those type of values. And as I say, I hope that we then pull those through uh, the programmes. Mary, thank you very much. That's a very interesting uh, perspective. And I, I know from our own engagement with the Institute that uh, you did terrific work. Some of those courses are really, uh, are really excellent ones. And uh, certainly have a great deal to developing culture in the banking industry. Derville, could I, could I come back to you and ask you, what in your view is the central bank's key objective in the implementation of the individual accountability framework? So never doing what I, I'm told. The team uh, had helped me uh, get ready today and suggested some notes and they wrote down the answer to this is governance. But actually that's not right. Governance is a tool that delivers something else. Better decision making, better outcomes. So if we stand back here, I've, I've built a career on getting involved in messy things. And what I learn is sometimes rare, things are deliberate and premeditated in a negative way. That's usually really, really rare and stand out exceptional. Quite often, you have fast moving problems that are being dealt with in a fragmented way with people thinking about narrow slices of the issue and uh, not really getting to grips with the big picture and the outcome. So good governance and really strong, clear arrangements help you deliver those better decisions and better outcomes. And the other um, piece I think of relevant information to this is what we learn over time about people, and people far more learned than I, have done an awful lot of studies into bad actors and bad apples theories, and anybody who's been hanging around debates and discussions around culture and effectiveness for a while will know about this. And surprising to us all, we are less important than we imagine as individuals. And actually, the group you hang out with, and the firms that you work for, and the collective atmosphere will have a far more significant operating influence on your ethical behavior than you may imagine. So if your mother told you, be careful, you know, who you are, I'll tell me who your company is and I'll tell you who you are. 
uh, she was right. So it actually means the collective behaviors that are the norms in the firms that people work in or the industries that we operate in have a transference effect on the individual that will have a powerful influence. It does mean that you may go into a workplace with an ethical disposition that is affected over time by the wider construct. So what are we trying to do here? We are trying to make sure at a collective level, at firm level, collectively, at industry level, collectively, at society level, collectively, in financial services, we are best set up to look at the big picture, to do that in a well-structured, organized way, to bring to bear competence, reliability, integrity, to bear on our work so we deliver good outcomes that supports individuals, consumers, business, the economies we serve, and help the businesses flourish. So simply put, it's actually about good outcomes. An interesting uh, observation. Uh, Derwin, that's uh, one of the things that we focus on the Irish Banking Culture Board, good customer outcomes. That's really what it's all about. And it feeds into something you quoted earlier on uh, in terms of culture. Be what your customers want you to be. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a really good approach. Uh, Colin, could I, could I go back to Colin Hunt and ask you, is there a risk that the new regime might deter well-qualified persons from seeking a senior position? Um... For instance, at board level, I suppose there is there, there is a risk. But if if in principle somebody came to you and said that a fundamental problem uh, with enhanced individual accountability it, that should be setting off alarm bells. It should be setting off alarm bells in terms of the recruiting bank, in my view. Um, it is possible that this uh, the, the the proposed new framework uh, could deter some individuals. Uh, I, I do think there may well be some people who will stand back and, 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 and want to see how it's being implemented and uh, to, to, to use a word that Derville used earlier, it, it's about being proportionate. And I think that if, if, if in its implementation it is seen to be fair, transparent and proportionate, this should have no detrimental impact in terms of attracting people into the sector. Like the, 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 you can have all the controls, risks, uh, frameworks, uh, procedures, policies, technology, databases you want, but ultimately, the, the 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 best means of ensuring that the banking system operates in the way that it should, and contributes to society and the economy in the way that it should. The best means of ensuring that is by attracting people of integrity and high caliber and competence and good skills into it. And it comes back to a point made by Mary in relation to the role of bodies like the like, like the IOB. Uh, but it, it comes down to people. We've got to ensure that as this is implemented, it is welcomed and seen as a positive for the industry and that it shouldn't be seen as a sort of filtering device which puts people away, puts people off joining the industry, either at very senior levels, at executive level, or indeed at, at governance level. But you know, ultimately, uh, the, the, the key test is going to be when we observe it being implemented. In principle, absolutely 100% supportive of it. We want to see it being introduced as quickly as possible across the bank that I'm um, asked to lead. Uh, but, um, you know, we will work uh, with determination uh, to ensure that we are ready for the full implementation of this. Uh, and we look forward to it being implemented in a way that is fair, transparent and proportionate. Thank you very much, Colin. Mary, could I come back to you and, uh, and ask you uh, what role, in, more broadly, what role can the education sector play in shaping ethics and culture? Yes, thanks. And, and just to build a little on what Colin uh, was saying there, I think there's a lovely quote uh, in the book that it talks uh, towards the end of it. It says the higher purpose must be one that gives bankers a sense of meaning so that their personal identity is intertwined with their professional role and activities. 
And again, if this is done correctly, it actually should give a whole sense of personal identity of working um, in a sector that really uh, embraces these type of values. And, and why I say that, and I think that's per particularly important to emphasize is, I'm really struck from an education point of view of the, the interdisciplinary nature of what we're talking about. So there's the technical piece, there's technical competence, there's all of that, but a real part of what we're looking at here is behavioral issues. And Derva made that point very much around, you know, how are you interacting with people? What are the behaviors that you are admiring and that you think are appropriate behaviors? And what are the ones that are most definitely not? So it, it's really looking at the behavioral science behind that uh, and making sure that we bring all of those in. I think uh, at third level, there's been a really strong focus within research uh, on ethics, um, but perhaps not across all third level programs, for example. And I'm not just talking about the IOB programs here, I'm talking in general of how people and um, the, the programs that people take when they come out of school. And another issue I think that the book addresses is that training should take place before people go into the industry. And because people go into the industry from many, many different disciplines, um, perhaps there is a consideration for putting something into third level curricula uh, around ethics and having that as a, as a staple piece. There's also a question, uh, again, if we go a step further, about whether, whether ethics should form a broader part of secondary or even primary curricula. And again, if we want to step back from just looking at financial sector and say, what kind of a society do we want to live in? There is a question again about how we, we embrace good citizenship. And I know there's, there are issues around that. Uh, there are already programs around that on the curriculum, but perhaps uh, really probing them in terms of the various sectors. The other thing I think as educators that we have to be really conscious of and building on that point around behaviors is, we have a responsibility, I think, within the education sector to make this kind of learning and education interesting for people. So, you know, if you say to, to somebody, you know, a program on ethics, it might necessarily be something that they're jumping to say, that sounds very exciting or interesting. And I think how we actually deliver that learning is hugely important. And so I know, for example, when we reviewed um, education just before we kicked off our current strategy, we saw that the audience uh, of our customers, uh, they take a lot of learning on the go. Uh, like the digital world that financial services is moving into, the world of education is very much moving into that as well. So we've actually designed now um, an app that people download. They set out a personal learning journey within that app. So within IOB Learn, they set out a personal learning journey and then they get content um, which suits wherever they're at at the moment. So they might get an hour or two content on something that's of interest, that they want to build up a, a bit more knowledge on, and then they can move all the way up to an accredited program, depending on what their learning needs are. But I think it's really important for us to say, as educators, are we moving towards that digital world? Are we taking lessons from behavioral scientists in how people want to learn? What's the best way for them to learn? Um, and let's make that something that's exciting and interesting for them. And I think we have to keep that as a responsibility for us. Now, I think um, for most of our designations I mentioned earlier, there is uh, ethics training that you have, to, you have to do to undertake that. And for me, that becomes more and more important as we move into the digital world. I think there's a huge distinguishing factor as we build out digital products. And as the world uh, interacts with each other in a very digital way, what will really set out the difference is human behaviours. How, uh, what the human behaviour, both in the interaction piece, in the design piece, in what's delivered, and we really need to, to understand that well. So ironically, I think in a digital age, it's more important than ever for us to understand the human mind and how the human mind works. Um, and that's why I'm really attracted, I think, to the way the book is put together. It draws on those different disciplines and it doesn't just look at a, a legal aspect, for example, um, or a criminology aspect. It actually draws in all the different disciplines, which I think uh, is something that we absolutely have to do. So I really do want to again commend Joe and Kieran for taking this on and indeed other academics right across the UCD who are looking at these behavioural issues around culture, I think it's hugely important.
Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Mary. Well, we're, we're coming very close to the end of our time slot. We maybe just have time for one more quick question. Uh, could uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the general scheme of the, of the framework uh, uh, in it, there is a focus on collective decision making by the inclusion of obligations in respect to collective decision making in the additional conduct standards. Derville, what is the rationale of this approach, do you think, uh, for this approach? And, and what does the central bank expect of individuals in, in this context? So actually, this was something really important that uh, when we were discussing our proposals uh, internally uh, in terms of the legislative framework that the um, Arrakis uh, and, and might eventually adopt, we were very, very keen to recognize the way that businesses operate um, is um, partially through the individual roles uh, and responsibilities of the various responsible people who run the business. But very importantly, uh, a little bit to what I said earlier, that that is all brought together holistically and collectively so that there's effective decision making. So. Um, I'll take an example uh, from years ago when I worked as a barrister in the UK. I did a lot of director's disqualification proceedings uh, many, many moons ago. And you would see specific responsibilities, uh, for example, for the finance director that were theirs to discharge. But equally, there's very important responsibilities collectively at board. One should not undermine the other. In fact, collective decision making should be well done, effective, and harness all the dimensions of competence and capability of the individual so they bring the best of themselves to bear upon that collective responsibility. So we were at pains to point out that you will have specific uh, accountabilities uh, and responsibilities that you will have to discharge within any corporate structure at individual level, but you will have responsibilities then collectively that will be different to that, and that must work in complementarity with each other. Both must work well. We were really concerned to make sure we support effective collective decision-making, as well as individual responsibilities, and that one should not undermine the other, that both should be done well in complement to each other, because decisions are often, we would say, best made through the collective. But there will be clear role and responsibility delineation uh, within that context. You as a senior executive in an organization will have jobs that you do and then jobs that you will do with others collectively. Both must be done. I'll stop there. Well, thank you very much uh, for those final concluding thoughts, Durable. Uh, I'm afraid we can't get to all the questions that we have. It's always impossible. Uh, I'd just like to thank, uh, first of all, our, our main speakers, uh, the, the Minister and Durval, and thank you again for your flexibility, Durval, in the circumstances where the Minister's schedule was a bit difficult, so not, that's much appreciated. And thanks also to, uh, to Mary O'D <coughs> and to uh, Colin Hunt, who uh, joined with uh, Kieran and Joe on the panel discussion. Uh, I think we've had a very interesting discussion to, today. There's been a lot of very thought-provoking ideas tossed around and um, and uh, so unfortunately we come we have to come to to an end uh, it's been a very difficult few years for all involved in the banking sector in Ireland starting with customers and including bank staff at all levels SMEs farmers senior customers customers in vulnerable situations the broad the broad community in in general our role on the Banking Culture Board, to which we are totally committed, is to work with the banks and all of the sector to build trustworthiness and thus regain the public trust. I want to take this opportunity to observe after three years of our board's existence that all in the industry who we have encountered have worked closely and well with us in this endeavour and it has made our job a good deal easier that there has been so much cooperation on the part of the banks, and I, I wish to acknowledge and salute that. The banking industry, as the Minister was saying earlier on, is a vital part of our society and economy, as are all those who work within it. Ireland needs a robust and trusted banking sector, and I believe that we are well on the way to achieving that essential goal. 
I see this forthcoming individual accountability framework as an opportunity for everyone directly involved to work closely together so that trust can be built up again. As this book demonstrates, that is how the individual accountability framework is working in the other countries studied. I hope and I believe that it is how it will work in Ireland. So I will close now with the three words that should close every book launch. Buy the book. Thank you all very much.